when Hindus and Buddhists use the word karma, the basic meaning of it is action, from the Sanskrit root kri, to do. And therefore there is some error in the common translation of karma as a law of cause and effect or of cosmic retribution. As a man sows, so also shall he reap. Uh, it has a Western flavor, which is a little causal. The way the Buddha put it was slightly different. This arises, that becomes. Because between this and that, there is a polar relationship. And the full explanation of karma in Buddhist philosophy is called Pratitya Samutpada, which means the interdependent origination of all the forms and phases of life. Pratitya Samutpada. And there are twelve links, shall we say, in the chain of interdependent origination, constituting a circle. And the existence of the circle depends on the presence of every one of the links. From one point of view in Buddhism, the chain of interdependent origination is looked upon as a chain, that is to say, as a form of bondage. The constituents, as it were, of the vicious circle in which most people and beings are living, which they call samsara, S-A-M-S-A-R-A, -S -A -A, samsara, the round of birth and death, the bhava chakra, the wheel of bhava which is becoming. And uh, so going round and round and round in the endless game of hide and seek is from one point of view bondage. Bondage to karma. And if you study the Bhagavad Gita, which is not a Buddhist book, but a Hindu scripture, Krishna, the spokesman of the Gita, explains that the wise man is one who does what is called nishkama karma, nishkama, N-I-S-H-K-A-M-A, -A, meaning um, passionless activity in the sense that he acts without seeking a result, without being motivated by the fruits of action, and therefore is not bound by his own action. You can be bound to samsara, the wheel of birth and death, by iron chains or gold chains. The chains are, I mean, I'm talking in a, more or less the language of popular Hinduism, that if you do bad deeds in this life, you will get a bad result next time. If you do good deeds in this life, you may be reborn as an angel or uh, as a monk, uh, in which you'll get a better chance of liberation. But still, so long as you're looking for results, be they good or evil, you're still bound. Now, the way in which one becomes, as it were, free of karma involves another Buddhist point of view, which is a kind of, a different way of looking at the chain of interdependent origination. It's the way which the Japanese call Jiji Muge. That is to say, the mutual interpenetration of all things and events. So that you could say that actually, in fact, deep, the deepest level of reality, this entire cosmos is a completely harmonious and blissful manifestation of uh, everything in a state of total enlightenment and mutual compassion. And therefore the task of the Buddhist or the Hindu discipline of meditation, the sadhana, the way of spiritual development, is to realize that, for everybody to realize it effectively in his own life, and therefore cease from the illusion 
that the universe is a fragmented uh, process of conflict. But first of all, we have to be clear about karma, that it is not to be understood in the Western sense of a law of cause and effect or of a sort of retribution system or a law. The word law is most unsuitable for concepts in Eastern Indian and Chinese philosophy. The word dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A, -A, sometimes meaning the Buddhist doctrine or a certain way of life when you talk about a person's dharma, you mean their own function. We would translate dharma as vocation. Sva is the same as the Latin suus, one's own. Dharma, function in this case, operation, way of life, style of life, profession, trade, role, means all those things. And the one thing that dharma really never means is law, although it's often translated that way. Because, you see, you don't get the idea of law until you move to a culture where order is based on the idea of obedience. It is believed generally in India that when a person sets out on the way of liberation, his first problem is to become free from his past karma. The popular theory of karma, the word that literally means action or doing, in Sanskrit, so that when we say that something that happens to you is your karma, it's like saying in English, it's your own doing. But in, in popular Indian belief, karma is a sort of built-in moral law, or a law of retribution, such that all the bad things you do and all the good things you do have consequences which you have to inherit. And so long as karmic energy remains stuck, all the bad things you do and all the good things you do have consequences which you have to inherit. And so long as karmic energy remains stored up, you have to work it out. And what the sage endeavors to do is a kind of action which in Sanskrit is called nishkama karma. Nishkama means without passion or without attachment, karma, action. And so, uh, whether he, whatever action he does, he renounces the fruits of the action so that he acts in a way that doesn't generate future karma because future karma continues you in the wheel of becoming samsara, the round, and keeps you being reincarnated. Now then, in that case, when the time comes that you start to get out of the chain of karma, all the creditors that you have start presenting themselves for payment. In other words, a person who begins, say, to study yoga is felt that he will suddenly get sick or that uh, his children will die or that uh, he'll lose his money or all sorts of catastrophes will occur because uh, the karmic debt is being cleared up. And uh, it, there's in no hurry to be cleared up if you're just living along like anybody. But if you embark on the spiritual life, a certain hurry occurs. And therefore, uh, since this is known, uh, it's rather discouraging to start these things. The, the well, Christian way of saying the same thing is that if you plan to, be, to change your life, shall we say, to turn over a new leaf, you mustn't let the devil know. Because he will oppose you with all his might if he suddenly discovers that you're going to escape from his power. So, for example, if you have a bad habit, say you drink too much, and you make a New Year's resolution that during this coming year you'll stop drinking, that's a very, very dangerous thing to do because the devil will immediately know about it. 
Uh, and what will happen will be this. That he will confront you with the prospect of 365 drinkless days. And that will be awful, you know, just overwhelming. <laughs> and you won't be able to make much more than three days on the wagon. So in that case, you compromise with the devil and say, just today I'm not going to drink, you see, but tomorrow may be, you know, we'll go back. Then when tomorrow comes, you say, oh, just another day, let's try out, that's all. And the next day you say, oh, one more day won't make much, much difference. So you only do it for the moment and you don't let the devil know that you have a secret intention of going on day after day after day after day. <clears throat> uh, but of course, there's something still better than that. And that is not to let the devil know anything. And that means, of course, not to let yourself know. One of the many meanings of that saying, let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth, is just this. And that was why in uh, Zen discipline, uh, a great deal of it centers around acting without premeditation. As those of you know who read Herigl's book, Zen in the Art of Archery, it was necessary to release the bowstring without first saying now. There's a wonderful story you may also have read by a German writer, von Kleist, about a, a, a boxing match with a bear. The man can never defeat this bear because the bear always knows his plans in advance and is ready to deal with any situation. The only way to get through to the bear would be to hit the bear without having first intended to do so. That would catch him. And so this is one of the great, great problems in the spiritual life, or whatever you want to call it, is to be able to have intention and act simultaneous. By this means you escape karma and you escape the devil. So, uh, you might say that the Taoist is uh, exemplary in this respect. That this is getting free from karma without making any previous announcement. Of simply, supposing we have a train and we want to unload the train of its freight cars. You can go to the back end and you can unload them one by one and shunt them into the siding. But the simplest of all ways of unloading is to uncouple between the engine and the first car and that gets rid of the whole bunch at once. And it is in that sort of way, you see, that the Taoist gets rid of karma without challenging it. And so, it has the reputation, you see, of being the easy way. There are all kinds of yogas and ways for people who want to be difficult. And uh, one of the great gambits of a man like Gurdjieff was to make it all seem as difficult as possible. Because that challenged the vanity of his students. If some teacher, some guru says, really, this isn't difficult at all, it's perfectly easy, uh, some people will say, oh, he's not really the, the real thing. Uh, we want something tough and difficult, and uh, when, when we see somebody starts out giving you a discipline that's very, very weird and rigid, people think, now there is the thing. That, that man means business. See? And so they flatter themselves by going to such a guy that they are serious students, whereas the other people are only dabblers and uh, so on. Uh, all right, if you have to do it that way, that's the way you have to do it. But uh, the Taoists 
has is the kind of person who shows you the shortcut and shows you how to do it by intelligence rather than effort because that's what it is Taoism is in that sense what everybody is looking for the easy way in, the shortcut using cleverness instead of muscle so the question naturally arises isn't it cheating? when in any game somebody really starts using his intelligence he will very likely be accused of cheating and to draw the line between skill and cheating is a very difficult thing to do you see the, the inferior intelligence will always accuse the superior intelligence of cheating that's its way of saving face you beat me by means that weren't fair we were originally having a contest to find out who had the strongest muscles and you know we were pushing against it like this, 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 this and uh, this would prove who had the strongest muscles but then you introduce some gimmick into it, some judo trick or something like that you see and you're not playing fair so in the uh, whole domain of ways of liberation there are roots for the stupid people and roots for the intelligent people and the latter are faster this was perfectly clearly explained by Hui Nang, the sixth patriarch of Zen in China in his uh, sutra where he says the difference between the gradual school and the sudden school is uh, they both arrive at the same point but the gradual is for slow-witted people and the sudden is for fast-witted people can you in other words find a way that sees into your own nature that sees into the Tao immediately and at the end of this morning's talk I pointed out to you the immediate way the way through now when you know that this moment is the Tao and this moment uh, is by its, considered by itself without past and without future eternal neither coming into being nor going out of being uh, there, there is nirvana and there is a whole Chinese philosophy of time based on this uh, it hasn't to my knowledge been very much discussed by Taoist writers it's been more discussed by Buddhist writers but it's all based on the same thing Dogen the great 13th century Japanese Zen Buddhist studied in China and he wrote a book called Shobo Genzo Eroshi recently said to me in Japan that's a terrible book because it tells you everything <laughs> it gives the whole secret away but in the course of this book he says You don't, there is no such thing as a progression in time. The spring does not become the summer. There is first spring and then there is summer. So in the same way, you now do not become you later. This is T.S. Eliot's idea in uh, Four Quartets where he says that the person who has settled down in the train to read the newspaper is not the same person who stepped onto the train from the platform and therefore also you who sit here 
are not the same people who came in at the door. These states are separate, each in its own place. There was the coming in at the door person, but there is actually only the here and now sitting person. And the person sitting here and now is not the person who will die. Because we are all a, a constant flux and the continuity of the person from past through present to future is as illusory in its own way as the upward movement of the red lines on a revolving barber pole. You know, it goes round and round and round and, and the whole thing seems to be going up or going down, whichever the case may be. But actually nothing is going up or down. So when you throw a pebble into the pond and you make a, a concentric rings of waves, there is an illusion that the water is flowing outwards. And no water is flowing outwards at all. Water is only going up and down. What appears to move outwards is the wave, not the water. So uh, the, this kind of philosophical argument says that our seeming to go along in a course of time it doesn't really happen. The Buddhists say, suffering exists, but no one who suffers. Deeds exist, but no doers are found. A path there is, but no one who follows it. And nirvana is, but no one who attains it. So, in this way they look upon continuity of life as the same sort of illusion that is produced when you take a cigarette and in the dark whirl it and the illusion of a circle is created whereas there is only the one point of fire the argument then is So long as you're in the present, there aren't any problems. The problems exist only when you allow presence to amalgamate. There's a way uh, of putting this in Chinese, uh, which is rather interesting. They have a very interesting sign, this. It's pronounced nyan, in Japanese, nyan. And the top part of the character uh, means now, and the bottom part means the mind heart, the shin. And so, this is, as it were, an instant of thought. In Sanskrit, they use, it, uh, they use this character as the equivalent for the Sanskrit word shana. Then if you put, if you double this character, put it twice, or three times, and I'll write the Chinese for ditto, um, <laughs> uh, nyan 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 means thought after thought after thought. Now, the, the Zen master Joshu was once asked, what is the mind of a child? And he said, a ball in a mountain stream. What do you mean by a ball in a mountain stream? He said, thought after thought after thought with no block. So, he was using, of course, the mind of the child as the innocent mind, the mind of a person who's enlightened. 
One thought follows another without hesitation. The thought arises, it doesn't wait to arise. As when you clap your hands, the sound issues without hesitation. When you strike flint, the spark comes out. It doesn't wait to come out. And that means that there's no block. So, thought, 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 nyan, 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 describes what we call in our world the stream of consciousness. Blocking consists in letting the, the stream become connected, chained together, in such a way that when the present thought arises, it seems to be dragging its past, or resisting its future, saying, I don't want to go. <laughs> When then the connection, the dragging, it's better to call it, of these thoughts drops, you've broken the chain of karma. If you think of this in comparison with certain problems in music, it's very interesting. Because when we listen to music, we hear melody only because we remember the sequence. We hear the intervals between the tones, but more than that, we remember the tones that led up to the one we are now hearing, and we are trained musically to anticipate certain consequences. And to the extent that we get the consequences we anticipate, we feel that we understand the music. But to the extent that the composer does not adhere to the rules and gives us unexpected consequences, we feel that we don't understand the music. And if he gives us harmonic relationships, which we are not trained to accept, that is to say, to expect, uh, we say, well, this man is just writing uh, garbage. But, of course, uh, it becomes apparent that the perception of music, the ability to hear melody, will depend upon a relationship between past, present and future sounds. And you might say, well, you're talking about a way of living that would be equivalent to listening to music with a tone-deaf mind. so that you would reduce, you would eliminate the melody and have only noise. And so in your Taoist way of life, you would eliminate all meaning and have only senseless present moments. Up to a point that's true. That is, in a way, what Buddhists and, uh, also mean by seeing things in their suchness. What is so bad about dying, for example? <coughs> it's really no problem. When you die, you just drop dead. That's all there is to it. But what makes it a problem is that you're dragging a past. And all those things you've done, all those achievements you've made, all these relationships and people that you've accumulated as your friends, all that has to go. See, it isn't here now. Uh, I mean, a few friends might be around you, but uh, all that past that identifies you as who you are, which is simply memory, all that has to go. And we feel just terrible about that. But if we didn't, if we were just dying, that's all, death wouldn't be a problem. So likewise, the chores of everyday life, they become intolerable. When everything ties together, all the past and the future, you feel it dragging at you every way. 
supposing you wake up in the morning, and it's a lovely morning. Let's take today, right here and now, here we are in this paradise of the place. Big Sur. And some of us have got to go to work on Monday. Is that a problem? For many people it is. It spoils the taste of what's going on now. When we wake up in bed on Monday morning and think of the various hurdles we've got to jump that day, uh, immediately we feel sad and bored and bothered. Whereas actually we're just lying in bed. <laughs> so the Taoist trick says, simply live now and there will be no problems. That's the meaning of the Zen saying, when you are hungry, eat. When you are tired, sleep. When you walk, walk. When you sit, sit. Rinzai, the great Tang Dynasty master, said, in the practice of Buddhism, there is no place for using effort. Sleep when you're tired, move your bowels, eat when you're hungry. That's all. The ignorant will laugh at me, but the wise will understand. <coughs> and so, also, the meaning of this wonderful Zen saying, uh, day, of the character for the sun, day, that is, good day. Every day is a good day. On condition, you see, that day day is like nyan nyan. They come one after another and yet there's only this one. You don't link them. This, as I intimated just a moment ago, seems to be an atomization of life. Things just do what they do. The flower goes poof, and people go this way, go that way, and so on, and that's, that's, that's what's happening. It has no meaning, it has no destination, it has no value, it's just like that. And when you see that, you see it's a great relief. That's all it is. But then when you are firmly established in suchness, in that it's just this moment, you can begin again to play with the connections. Only you've seen through them. And, but now you see uh, they, they don't haunt you. Because you know that there isn't any continuous you running on from moment to moment who originated at some time in the past and will die at some time in the future. All that's disappeared. So you can have enormous fun anticipating the future, remembering the past, and uh, playing all kinds of continuities. This is the meaning of that famous Zen saying about mountains are mountains. To the naive man, mountains are mountains, waters are waters. To the intermediate student, mountains are no longer mountains, waters are no longer waters. In other words, they've all dissolved into the point instant, to the kshana. But for the fully perfected student, mountains are again mountains and waters are again waters. <coughs> 